why is it important to look at current events? Yeah, do you remember what Jesus said when he was talking to some of those who were critical? He said, you hypocrites, you can tell the weather, but you don't discern the signs of the times. So I would like to share a little bit more, again, some current events that have been taking place. Last week, I shared with you the first ever ministerial to advance religious freedom was held. And this was held and sponsored by the US Department of State. Very interesting, right? And what Mr. Secretary said, the US Secretary of State says, Catholic Church has a central role in fighting for religious freedom. Now, I don't know about you, but the Catholic Church doesn't have necessarily the best reputation in fighting for the religious freedom of all. However, we can see that things are taking a trend, right? A certain trend is happening. Well, this week, something else happened. Attorney General Sessions announced a new religious liberty task force. Interesting. And Mr. Sessions gave a, uh, some words. He said, the Religious Liberty Task Force will continue the department's ongoing work to implement the Religious Liberty Memorandum and the Implementation Memorandum. Sessions stated in the memo, the task force will also consider new initiatives that will further the department's work to protect and promote religious liberty. Well, we're for religious liberty, aren't we? And then he did something at the end of his speech, and he said, and now I have the pleasure of introducing Archbishop Bishop Joseph Kurtz, someone who is an expert on these matters. In 2010, he was elected vice president of the US Conference of Catholic Bishops, and then served as president from 2013 to 2016. In 2017, he was elected chairman of the Conference's Committee for Religious Liberty. So whose interest do you think they're going to be for? Just a thought, right? So now we have the State Department. We have the Justice Department. What about Congress? Have they said anything recently? <coughs> Paul Ryan, who is he? Who is he? Speaker of the House, third in the chain of command, right? Paul Ryan says America needs Catholicism weeks after failed chaplain ousting. And if you look at uh, some of the words here, the under, uh, underlined word, our social doctrine is the perfect antidote for what ails our culture. And he sees this tremendous opportunity for Catholics to lead and help bring our culture and our country closer to their great moral potential. Now don't misunderstand me, I'm not condemning all of what Catholics believe, right? However, when we combine prophecy with current events, we see a change is taking place. And Jesus told us to watch and pray. And in fact, we were given counsel, Review and Herald, June 15, 1897, paragraph 10. Protestants will work upon the rulers of the land to make laws to restore the lost ascendancy of the man of sin who sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Roman Catholic principles will be taken under the care and protection of the state. Was she a prophet or not? Signs of the times. Continuing on, you know, I, I happen to, I don't subscribe to GQ magazine, I don't read you GQ magazine, so don't misunderstand, but I do keep an eye out for things. And they recently had an article that said, 21 books you don't have to read. What do you think was one of those books on their list? The Bible, of course. The Holy Bible, they said, is rated very highly by all the people who supposedly live by it, but who in actuality have not read it. And you know what? That's a good point. How many of us Christians claim to live by God's word, but are we actually studying God's word? And then they go on to say, those who have read it know there are some good parts, but overall it is certainly not the finest thing that man has ever produced. Well, yeah, man didn't produce it because holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. It is repetitive, self-contradictory, uh, sententious, I think it says, foolish, and even at, Ill, at times ill-intentioned. Well, you know, we can understand their point of view, right? 
because the carnal mind is enmity with God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be, Romans 8, 7. Another thing that caught my eye, in Pennsylvania, a cease and desist order, town orders family to stop hosting Bible studies on their farm. Have you heard this? This is a 35 acre farm in Pennsylvania. And I looked into it, it's been a tradition of this farm, even by the previous owner, to have religious assemblies there, to have Bible studies, this has been going on for decades. Well suddenly now, the powers that be decided they wanted to put a stop to this. Borough leaders accused Scott and Terry Federoff of improperly using their 35 acre farm as a place of worship, a place of assembly, and as a commercial venue. Maybe they're just looking for more tax dollars, what do you think? They were, observed, they were served a cease and desist order in October 2017, the Post-Gazette reported. Borough officials filed a notice of violation cease and desist order and seek to impose zoning restrictions such as those applicable to places of worship, like churches and synagogues, on the Federhoff's activities. However, secular counterparts to these activities, like parties, political fundraisers, and book clubs, are just okay. And so the Independence Law Center filed Federhoff versus Borough of Zwicky Heights today in the U.S. District, District Court. This was last week, I believe. Uh, for the Western District of Pennsylvania. The case raises claims involving religious freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, and equal protection. We see all these issues being agitated today, don't we? And now, something I saw that actually spurred the impetus of this message today. Jimmy Carter says Jesus would approve of gay marriage. Now, Mr. Carter, with all due respect, claims to be a Christian. He's a Sunday school teacher. He's been involved in the faith for years and years. Says he's got a strong faith. Well, let's listen to his own words. And, Chua, I hope the, I've got this changed, so it should be, the sound should be going through. My oath of office was to obey the Constitution and, as in, me, and, and the laws of this country as interpreted by the Supreme Court. So I, I went along. Do you have the sound up on the HDMI? Because I've changed it before. I mean, I'm... Maybe I can just turn the volume up on the monitors. <clears throat> when he starts talking here, he had just been asked a question about abortion, who he said he does have a problem with. So just to give you some context, let's try it again. Oh. My, my oath of office was to obey the Constitution and, as in, and, and the laws of this country as interpreted by the Supreme Court. So I, I went along with that, but, but that's been the only caveat. So when I was Would in, Jesus approve gay marriage? I, I, believe, I believe he would. I believe Jesus would. I don't, I, I don't have any verse in Scripture. No, 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 but I just uh, intuitively, yeah. No, I, 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 I believe that Jesus would approve gay marriage, but I'm not. That's just my own personal belief. Yes. Yeah. I, th I think Jesus would encourage any sort of love affair if it was honest and sincere and, um, and was not damaging to anyone else. And I don't see that gay marriage damages anyone else. Okay, Jesus would encourage any love affair, right? Jesus is about love. And he doesn't see that gay marriage damages anyone else. Hmm. Yeah, I, okay. You know, I've got to, um, pardon me for a second here, I've got to, for some reason I'm not getting two screens. No, it must have, um, I, I got it now, it must have, some, it's up here. It's up here. sometimes these things, um, no, I just changed it. I should be good. I'm good now. office was to obey the Constitution and, as in, and, and the laws of this country as interpreted by the Supreme Court. So I, I went along with that, but, but that's been the only caveat. So when I was in... Would Jesus look for gay marriage? I believe, I believe he would. I believe he would. But I don't know how to have any new verse in Scripture. No, 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 but that's just that intuitively. Yeah, I, 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 I would believe that, that Jesus would approve gay marriage, but I'm not... That's just my own personal belief. Yeah. I 
I, I think Jesus was really encouraging him for the love and prayer that was honest and sincere and, um, and was not damaging to anyone else. And I don't see the gay marriage damaging to anyone else. I think this is a good object lesson for all of us. How is it that we can be uh, spending time with Christ? We can be claiming to be a Christian, but yet it seems like we come short of certain understandings. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are all sinners, and you have come to save us. You have come to lift us up. You have come to pull us out of the miry pit. You have come to give us understanding and wisdom. And we pray for your Holy Spirit now to do just those things. In Jesus' name, amen. Will the real Jesus please stand up? It's important to us, right? The three angels' message. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach. To how many? To them that dwell on the earth, that includes every single soul. And to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And what must we say with a loud voice? Fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment will come, is come, right? Has come. And worship him that made what? The heaven and the earth, the sea and the fountains of water. David, thank you for sharing those tidbits of information today about this wonderful creation that we have. But we don't want to worship that creation. We have to worship the creator of the creation. How are we going to fear God? How are we going to go give glory to him? Right? It says give glory to him. Especially now when judgment time is here, if we don't know him. Right? Isn't that a logical question? We've got to know him. So we need to look in the right place very quickly if we're going to find him. And I believe we're living in a great age of wickedness. We see it all around us. Where the wicked seem to prosper at our expense, right? Have anybody else had that feeling? Well, we're not alone because there was a psalmist also who had that feeling. Turn with me to Psalm 73. Psalm 73, this is a psalm of Asaph. And he had these very same sediments. And let's look at verses 1 through 3 initially. Are you there? Amen. Amen. Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone, and my steps had well nigh slipped. He's starting to lose some faith, maybe. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Do we see that happening today? Jump down to verse 9. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walketh through the earth. Verse 11, and they say, how doth God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Verse 12, behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. We see this happening. People of influence, people of power, making statements about our Christ. They seem to be prospering. The psalmist was, psalmist was looking for a place of hope. And you know, he found it. Look at verse 17. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. Ah, the sanctuary. Is that a place where we can find an understanding of God? Psalm 77, verse 13 says, Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? If I really want to understand God, I have to look at the sanctuary. We have to turn to the sanctuary. When did the sanctuary first appear? Well, you know the story. God told Moses to make them a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Dwell. What does that word dwell mean? Do you know? To live, to lodge, to reside. And you know, the connotation of that word is not just a temporary look. I'm going to go to the lodge for a while and have a vacation, but I'm coming back home. No, it was a permanent dwelling. God's in intention was to permanently be with his people. And in Exodus 25, 40, he says, And look that thou make them after their pattern, which was showed me in the mount. So God showed him a pattern, 
you know, sometimes when we build things, we have a pattern to go by. If I'm trying to make a certain item that's complicated, I'll make a pattern first before I make the real thing. This pattern was just an image of the real. It wasn't the real, was it? Where is the real? We'll find out. So Moses directed the people of God as God had shown him, and they built this first sanctuary where God was to come close to his people. This sanctuary, and you know, I believe in order to understand the book of Revelation, in order to understand the book of Daniel, in order to understand the book of Hebrews, in order to understand many of the Psalms, we need to understand the sanctuary. And as a quick refresher, you remember some of the items that we have. We have the inner, the outer courtyard. We have the furniture in the courtyard, the altar of burnt offering. We have the laver. And then we have the inner part, that inner tent, where the holy place is, where the, the candlestick is found, the table of showbread, the altar of incense. And then we have the most holy, where the Ark of the Covenant was found. These items represent God's plan of salvation for us. They tell us about God himself. And as they were finished building this first sanctuary, then something happened in Exodus 40, 34. It said, then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon and the glory of the Lord filled the the sanctuary, the tabernacle, right? God's glory filled the place. This sanctuary was used for many years. It traveled with them wherever they went, right? Until they had their own land, the promised land. Then it was time to make a more permanent structure. And so Solomon and all the congregation with him went to the high place that was at Gibeon, for there was the tabernacle of the congregation of God, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, had made in the wilderness. And then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem in Mount Moriah. Interesting, Mount Moriah. You know what else took place on Mount Moriah? Yeah, Isaac, Abraham, same location. Interesting. Was God trying to teach them something all of those many years ago? Where the Lord appeared unto David his father in the place that David had prepared in the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. And so they built this wonderful temple. It's called Solomon's temple, but it really wasn't Solomon's, was it? It was the Lord's house. It was the Lord's temple. And it was glorious. And it was finished in 960 BC. And when it was finished, a similar event took place as what took place in the first tabernacle or first sanctuary. It says now in 2 Chronicles 7, 1 and 2, now when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the house. Amen, right? And the priest could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. Wow. Turn with me, if you will, to Chronicles, Second Chronicles, chapter 7. The glory of the Lord filled the house. And God gives a little bit of advice, something that we should heed today. Let's look at verses 14 through 22 of 2 Chronicles 7. In verse 14, it starts by saying, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Amen. Now mine eyes shall be open, and my ears attentive, attent unto the prayer that is made in this place, speaking of his house that was made. His ear would incline to his people if they were obeying him, right? For now I have chosen and sanctified this house, that my name may be there forever, and mine eyes and my heart shall be there perpetually. And as for thee, if thou wilt walk before me as David thy father walked, now he's addressing specifically to Solomon, and to do according to all that I have commanded thee, and shall observe my statutes and my judgments, then I will establish the throne of thy kingdom, according as I have coveted with David thy father, saying, There shall not 
failed thee a man to be ruler in Israel. But, oh, there's that word again, but if ye turn away and forsake my statutes and my commandments, which I have set before you, and shall go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will pluck them up by the roots out of my land, which I have given them. And this house, which I have sanctified for my name, will I cast out of my sight and will make it to be a proverb and a byword among all nations. And this house, which is high, shall be an astonishment to everyone that passes by, by it, so that he shall say, Why hath the Lord done this unto this land and unto this house? And it shall be answered, Because they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them, out, brought them forth out of the land of Egypt, and laid hold on other gods, and worship them and serve them. Therefore hath he brought all this evil upon them. Could the same thing happen to us as a people? This should be a warning to all of us not to let anything come between us and God, right? To test all things according to God's word. Be like the Bereans to study, to show themselves approved. Well, we know that this prophecy was fulfilled, right? They forsook the God, their God, and their house was destroyed. And it was many years later that it was rebuilt by Zerubbabel in 516 BC. But this temple wasn't quite the same as the one before. Let's look. In Haggai 2, 1 through 3, it says, In the seventh month, in the one and twentieth day of the month came the word of the Lord by the prophet Haggai, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, son of Sheltiel, I believe, governor of Judah, and to the Joshua, the son of Jodedek, the high priest, and to the residue of the people, saying, Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? Some were still alive who saw the first one. How do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? You know, some of the people wept saying, this temple is nothing compared to what it was. What was missing from this temple? The glory of God. And what else? The Ark of the Covenant. But God gave them a promise. Praise the Lord that he gives us promises just when we need them, right? Have you found that true in your life? Just when you need him most? But thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once, it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. Praise the Lord. And I will fill this house with, this house, this particular house, he said, right? The one that was just rebuilt, that didn't have the glory of the previous one, that didn't have the Ark of the Covenant, and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than that of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. So you know, when was this prophecy fulfilled? When? When Jesus himself came and entered into the temple? The same temple that Herod had just finished rebuilding? This prophecy was fulfilled. This was the very same house where Jesus Christ, God in human form, would enter and bring his glory into it. And John 1.14, we know this, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. There's that word again, dwelt. Pitched a tent, desired to be with us. And now type would meet anti-tape, right? And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus Christ brought himself into that temple and his glory is what filled it and made it greater than even the one before. Type would meet anti-type. And the cross meant the end of this earthly ministry and the beginning of another ministry. Matthew 27, 50 through 51 says, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent 
Didn't the prophecy said he was going to shake the earth? In Desire of Ages, it says the priest is about to slay the victim, but the knife drops from his nerveless hand as this big curtain is rent from top to bottom. Type has met anti-type in the death of God's son. The great sacrifice has been made. The way into the holiest is laid open. A new and living way is prepared for all. No longer need sinful, sorrowing humanity await the coming of the high priest. Henceforth, the Savior was to officiate as priest and advocate in the heaven of heavens. No longer did they need to come to that temple priest. And no longer today do people need to go and confess to a priest, right? So what is the significance of all this? Hebrews 8, 1 through, set, 1 through 2 says, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. How does that speak to our hearts today? Do we have to keep on sinning? Do we have to make excuses for sin? Do we have to say this sin is okay because God is a God of love? For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, wherefore it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law who serve unto the example and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. This pattern was merely a small scale model of the vast, wonderful, and glorious heavenly sanctuary. Think of it. How many angels are we told are in heaven? Right? We can't count the thousands and thousands and 10,000 times 10,000, right? How big must the sanctuary be when they all come to worship together? This pattern only gives us a small, little, dark view of what it's all about. But we can understand certain things. We can understand where God dwells. In 1 Kings 8.27, it says, But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. How much less this house that I have builded, said Solomon. Our meager attempts at worship cannot really give glory to God, can they? Notice what Solomon said in his prayer of the dedication of the earthly temple. He said that thine eyes may be open towards this house night and day, even towards the place of which thou hast said, my name shall be there that thou mayest hearken unto the prayer which thy servant shall make towards this place. And hearken thou to the supplication of thy servant and of thy people Israel when they shall pray towards this place and hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place and when thou hearest, forgive. When we come to this place, we come to see God. We come to give glory to God. We come to receive from God what he wants us to have. His grace his power, his overcoming power, not to be saved in sin, but to be saved from our sin. In Acts 7, 47 through, 8, or through 50, excuse me, but Solomon built him a house. Howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. What house will ye build me, saith the Lord? Oh, what is the place of my rest? Hath not my hand made all these things? How important to understand creation then, just like the, third, the first angel's message, right? Fear him who made heaven and earth. So clearly the earthly sanctuary was only a model of the true, where God dwells, where he rules over all the universe. Seeing then that God is ruling from his heavenly throne, and he is the maker of all things, isn't he the one who gets to, to decide what's right and wrong? In this sanctuary are demonstrated all the doctrines of God, all the doctrines of the Bible, all the ways of God's government, even how our bodies are to be the temple of God. 
In John 2, 19 and 21, Jesus answered and said to him, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And the Jews said, forty and six years was this temple in building and thou will rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, no, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. If our bodies are the temple of God, can we at the same time commit an abomination in our bodies and be right with God? Ephesians, now therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building, fitly framed together, groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. If we are all to fit together, right? And remember how the first Solomon's temple was built? All those pieces were made off-site, and then everything came together and fit perfectly together? Isn't that how we are supposed to be? We're to fit perfectly together? Each doing our own Ability, each doing our own purpose in that building. You know, many times I have to make some things that are kind of tricky, especially when I get into some of the cabinet work and kitchen work and things like that. And, you know, I have to carefully measure and cut, and sometimes I have just enough material, especially if somebody else has provided the material for me. And, Wayne, you know what I'm talking about. You have just enough, so you make one wrong cut, and now you're in trouble, right? And so you have to make sure that everything fits just right. Well, how is it with us? How does God want to use us? If we're not fitting according to his word, can he use us in his work? Can this, shouldn't this same spirit be guiding all of us and bringing us into harmony and unity? Isaiah 5.20 is a great verse for us today. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. We see many things in our world today calling evil good and good evil. Many of these evils are in the church, and we must have a clear understanding of God and his law so that we will not be deceived. And hopefully during the next few Sabbaths, we're going to take a closer look at the sanctuary and what the sanctuary has to tell us. In closing, let's deal specifically with Mr. Carter's statement. Revelation 21, 6, And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. One of the problems I see in our culture today is that people are not thirsting for the righteousness of God. They want to do their own thing. And unfortunately, some even in our own denomination are saying, yeah, we have to accept all people. Well, let me make a clear distinction. What is Jesus saying here? Yeah, he accepts all people. Absolutely. We're all sinners, are we not? And we come to him in our sinful flesh. And what's the next thing we do? We repent and confess our sins. And he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from a little unrighteousness. All. Oh. Ooh, I've got to make a change. But not me, but God in me, right? This living water, because I'm thirsty, I drink of this living water, and it starts to do something in me that I can't do for myself. And a change is wrought. You know, this LGBT thing is getting bigger and bigger. And certainly, we are to accept people where they are. But God doesn't leave us where we are, does he? He has wonderful ideals for us. He has a mission for each one of us, no matter where we've come from, no matter what we've been through. Each one of us is a precious stone in the house of God that he wants to perfect for his service. And he will if you allow him. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. Do you want to overcome? and inherit all things? I do. 
That's why I have to pray continually. Lord, don't give up on me. Help me each and every day to become more like you by drinking that living water, by surrendering my will to yours. Mr. Carter mentioned that Jesus would approve of all love affairs. What about a selfish love affair, Mr. Carter? What about a, a love that, it, that makes yourself bigger than God? Wasn't that the love that Satan had? Certainly Jesus would approve if he approves of all love affairs that are honest and sincere. Well, how do we, deter how do we determine what's honest and sincere? By our own standards? If it feels good, do it. No, we must humble ourselves and submit to the will of God. How often in our own day is the love of pleasure disguised by a form of godliness? A religion that permits men while observing the rites of worship to devote themselves to selfish or sensual gratification is as pleasing to the multitudes now as in the days of Israel. And there are still pliant errands who, while holding positions of authority in the church, will yield to the desires of the unconsecrated and thus encourage them in sin. Heaven forbid. You know, we have to be familiar with scripture, right? We have to be able to test the spirits. I'm not going to go through these because of the sake of time, but if you want to jot down some scriptures, Leviticus 18 22 through 26 and 20 and verse 13. That's Leviticus. Just, just look at chapter 18. It makes it very clear. Deuteronomy 23, 17. Deuteronomy 23, 17. Romans, first chapter of Romans. Read the whole chapter. God's word is not hard to understand. Only if you choose not to want to understand it. If you don't want to follow it, right? And getting back to creation was... Was God creating Adam and Steve? Mary and Eve? Or did he make them male and female? And did he tell them how to live? And how to live in a way that would not only give glory to God, but benefit themselves? We must be clear and we must be willing to stand up and say, no, this is not the God I serve. This is not the God that I love. This is not the God that loves you. Turn from your ways and be saved. Don't be lost. God loves us. But his love is sometimes a tough love, isn't it? But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable, did, did God call certain things abomination? Absolutely. And murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters, etc., all shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And if we really love these people, will we want to see them continue in their way and be lost? Is that love? No. I don't know about you, but I want the real Jesus to stand up today. I want the real Jesus to stand up in your hearts and in my hearts. To shine forth as the noonday. To call a people to repentance and confess their sins, for the day of judgment is at hand. We see the signs all around us. How much longer before the time of trouble really comes? Worship him who made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that in them is. Love the truth. Speak the truth in season and out of season. Walk your faith. Talk your faith. Lift up your heads. Because Jesus is soon to stand up. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. Even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Are you looking for deliverance this morning, my friends? Every one that shall be found written in the book. I pray that my name will be there, and I pray yours will too. Father in heaven, these things in this world that lead to destruction are swirling all around us. Now is not the time for us to give way but to remain firm in you and your word. Please, Lord, by your spirit, guide us and direct us that not one be lost and, not, and that we were, will be able to speak when you give us words of wisdom to speak, words of encouragement, even words of rebuke, but always words of love.
Father, help us, we pray, in Jesus' name, to be your people. Amen.